Welcome in Slump Busters. You are coming in after a 16 point victory by my Boston Celtics in game three to take a 2 1 series lead. But the question still remains of who has the advantage moving forward throughout this series. Um, obviously, the Warriors came into the series as the favorites, and the Celtics now have the early advantage. So it kind of changes the math a little bit. Question marks of whether or not Steph Curry is going to be even available in game four after a late game scrum in which um, he kind of had his ankle rolled over a little bit. Uh, Kyle, what are your early thoughts on the series so far to this point? So as someone who who took the gambling odds at face value and said the Warriors probably win in like six and a half, you know, six, seven games, more semantics there. I think Boston's a better team. After three games, I think Boston is the more well-constructed basketball team. And they're, the fourth quarter defense for Boston was so good in game three. It was revelatory for me. And it's not like I haven't been watching Boston for the last two months, like dominate teams on defense, but it was incredible how well they played at the end of that basketball game. Just because Boston's the better team doesn't guarantee they're going to win the series. But the thing that I've kind of learned through three games is the ball is in Boston's offense's court at this point. So the, the Boston defense has been pretty consistent but the Warriors have created this system, this robotic offense, where it's basically like, if we shoot 40% from three, we will score 110 points. This seems to be something they've mastered over seven years. As long as they shoot that percentage from three, they're going to be able to get 110 points. Boston's offense in the first three games has gone wildly sporadic to a fourth quarter in game one where they had like 40 points in the fourth quarter and 120 in the game. And they shot like seven for eight from three. And then in game two, they only scored 90 points. And then in this game, they scored 116 combined with Draymond Green having the worst game he's ever played in an NBA finals during, and he's played like 30 NBA finals games. Now this was the worst finals game Draymond Green has ever played. Celtics offense seems to be the great like caveat of what's going to happen in the series. What's going to happen between you know, the, the results of each of these games, because, you know, 110 points for Golden State would have been good enough to win game two, not good enough to win games one and three. So if Boston can get to 110, then it looks pretty good. Like they have a chance to win this whole thing. And if Steph Curry's down, it changes all the math because then the Warriors don't have much of a chance offensively. But Boston right now looks like the better team. And that's not something I thought coming into the series. I'm going to assume that Steph Curry is going to play game four, mostly because it's the NBA Finals, so guys will work through injuries. I, I think if you look at the Celtics alone, you have Robert Williams working through injuries. You have Marcus Smart working through injury. And I think when we have this series over with, we're going to find out that Jason Tatum's been dealing with some sort of shoulder ailment since the Eastern Conference Finals. It seems like every couple games you see him grabbing at that shoulder. It's not necessarily after just missed shots. He, even after made baskets, he's grabbing at that shoulder. So it's not just a frustration injury. I think there's legitimately something there that he's not talking about, but as long as he keeps playing, it's, it's okay. You know, I mean, he feels confident enough that he's ready to play mama mentality, right. Is taking the reins there and playing in these games, regardless of injury status, you, you brought up some valid points that certainly the Warriors offense is the make or break for the series uh, vis-a-vis with that, with the Boston Celtics offense and their sporadic nature, but that's just kind of the Celtics. They're just going to have these moments in which they go ice cold, can't buy a bucket. And that's something that's more or less baked into their minutia as a team. But when they have the game close, there's a realistic shot in every aspect that they're going to win said game. Because like you said, they're a better constructed team than this Warriors team. They, they know how to take advantage of the matchup advantages they do have because Robert Williams looked healthy in game three and the Warriors didn't really have an answer for him down low. Robert Williams was a big disruptor down there. Uh, the block shots on the floaters, um, Steph Curry got blocked. It was a block party for a little bit down the stretch run there. Uh, Jalen Brown got a block in. everyone is getting involved. And you mentioned Draymond's poor for performances uh, for offensively. It doesn't seem like that's going to change. The biggest thing that's going to change for Draymond offensively is going to be his ability to get the ball in the hands of his more dynamic teammates, Steph and Clay. And that was the best Clay game that we saw of the series. I, I think that I feel confident that will be the best Clay game of the series with him putting up 25 points. He's still going to be a contributor. And I still think that that matchup is going to be very relevant. But I, I think that the fact that Celtics were able to survive that run by Clay Thompson, where he's just throwing up shots and they're going in, 
I think was very important. And then you look at the fourth quarter where Clay went ice cold again. Steph being gimpy throughout the rest of this series, again, regardless if he does play or doesn't play, uh, changes things because the Celtics have been able to take advantage of him on the defensive side of things. And it's not like a healthy Steph is a great defender by any means, but I will take my chances against a Steph that also has an ankle ailment when it comes to Jason Tatum driving to the basket. He's going to win that matchup 10 out of 10 times. It's just going to be a matter of whether or not he sinks the basket because those um, layups that he didn't convert on were definitely frustrating watches and were part of the big rallies by the Warriors. I don't know if they're going to fix the third quarter issues. It, it's just going to be a matter of can the Celtics just kind of like hold them, keep them in within a reasonable margin because they survived that run. The Warriors took that one point lead and then that was their last lead of the game from that point forward. I think if you, in totality, the Warriors only led what a minute or two in that game. And obviously down that stretch run, I mean, you take a 16 point lead and you make them quit with the three minutes left to go on the clock. That says a lot about how that game went for the Warriors. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing about Tatum that you brought up is he hasn't been a huge factor so far in the series, like the way that we think of Jason Tatum being a 35-point-a-game guy, like that we've kind of evolved. But Yeah, I mean, if 25... we were to rank the MVP odds, we'd probably put Jalen Brown ahead of Jason Tatum at this point for the Celtics, respectively. No, I wouldn't go that far because Jalen Brown hasn't been exceptional either for Boston. Like, really? just giving them because 20 if you look game, at all three but... games, even the loss, he's been putting up over 20 points and been that spark plug for them in the first quarter, because I, I think the early lead was just as important to the Celtics winning this game as anything they did late in the game. I think Tatum is still number one. And the reason Tatum is still number one is because you can't give team defense a finals MVP award. Like if they could, it's the same reason why Marcus Smart got defensive player of the year. Like Robert Williams probably should have gotten defensive player of the year. You just needed to give it to someone from the Boston Celtics. But when I look so, at that fourth quarter in game one, Jalen Brown was the initiator on offense that got the Celtics that ultimate win. Yes, you had the big threes from Derek White, Al Horford, and Marcus Smart. But without Jalen Brown getting them going, I don't think the Celtics win that game. I, I think that he was a big part of that turning point, and that's essentially won them that game. If Jalen Brown doesn't show up in that late third, early fourth quarter, they don't win that game one, and they don't have this 2-1 series lead at this point. You could say that the... Jason Tatum assist in that game were just as important, but at the same time, he just got it into open shooters hands and they were able to sink the three, which is still an assist. It still counts for the stats, but I, I don't think it's like an impressive assist. It just, the guy sank the basket, you know? I still feel confident that Tatum is like going to be the finals MVP, but it's closer than we thought originally. Cause like Jalen Brown has been Jalen Brown. And that's something that's pretty cool. Like he had 17 points, 24 points, 27 points. Like he's averaging 21 points. A game. That's Jalen Brown and playing good defense and swatting passes and all that. So Tatum in that respect, the thing that I've learned is like, when things start bleeding, he can still be the guy who goes and gets you a bucket, which is really valuable in the NBA because there's not a ton of players in that regard. And I know everyone remembers the one where we like yeah. laid it up contouring. I, I in think, at the end, again, but. it's just going to come down to he hasn't really had a signature game in the series where Jalen Brown's been the more consistent contributor in all three games. And I think that that would win out. And the fact that Jalen Brown is leading this team in scoring through three games would make him the favorite on the outset and he's just looked better. Like he he's looked better th consistently throughout the games. You, you feel more confident with the ball in his hands, even though his dribbling mechanics still are frustrating for Celtics fans when he goes in the paint. I, I think that Jalen Brown through three games has been more effective for the Celtics. And you go back to the game one again, Jason going three for 17, I, I think was a killer towards any MVP projection if we're talking about in Vegas, but that's also assuming that Celtics ultimately win the series. If you were to look contrary on the opposite side, if Steph does play the remainder of the series and the Warriors do win, you would say Steph Curry's probably on pace for his finals MVP. Yeah, I think there's no question about the Steph Curry side of things. It's really interesting how that's worked out because the, the beauty of the Boston Celtic offense, I mean, again, like we could dumb all this analysis down to in the first uh, game of the series, Al Horford, Marcus Smart and uh, Derek White had 48 points. And then in game uh, game two, they had a combined like six points. And then in game three, they had a combined 40 something points. So like at a simple point, that can be how the offense gets broken down. But I think the Warriors might be willing to 
live with Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum being the entire offense, especially if they're going to take a lot of mid range shots. Cause what's similar for the Warriors is that, you know, we talk, we talk about clay a lot because clay's probably going to be a hall of famer and all that stuff. The best player on the Warriors is Steph Curry. The second best player is Draymond green. Cause Draymond green changes the way that defense operates by his presence. Yeah. He's not going to score, but like they don't need him to score. The third best player on the team is Wiggins, and you could argue the fourth best player on the team is Jordan Poole. Now it's probably Clay Thompson, but and like the difference that's the analysis in game there. three when you mentioned that Draymond's their second best player is that Draymond was having a horrible game, not only from an offensive standpoint, but Robert Williams and Grant Williams were just beating him, like on getting those rebounds, getting those offensive rebounds, and the extra possessions were the biggest thing that changed the course of that game, I think, for the Celtics. You look at the game two, the Celtics weren't getting those hustle plays. They weren't getting the offensive rebounds. Hell, Kayvon Looney was having more of those offensive boards come his way. And a lot of those are luck, right? It just hits off the rim and lands in a guy's hands. But this one, you actually felt the effort in getting those offensive rebounds for the Celtics. Again, even though it sucks that Seth Curry got hurt on the play, the dog pile at the end, it just shows how much more willing the Celtics were to get down and dirty and go for that ball. And there was another offensive rebound like that too, where they had to fight and claw it to grab, grab the ball and they turned it into a basket. And that those type of plays just really turned around the game. I, I think it was Grant Williams that came up with it and managed to put it in to the basket too, to give them a four, six point lead very late in the game. A guy mm-hmm. like Grant Williams putting up 10 points is huge. Uh, a guy like Robert Williams gained 10 rebounds is huge. Um, you mentioned the importance of those role players. Yeah, they, they are big. And I think what Ime was able to do with the rotations was also what helped the Celtics get that game three victory because you notice very early on, he started with Robert Williams for the first three, four minutes of the first quarter. And then he went small ball, gained Derek White into the lineup because the Celtics, I think when they went small, that's been their best remedy for the Warriors. Uh, when Derek White's been the game, because even if Derek White's not sinking threes, he's a pest defensively. And that's really seemed to bother the Warriors whenever he's been on the court. And Peyton Pritchard has been a surprise too in that regard. Even though he's a smaller guy, he's just so active when he's up on defense. He has active hands. And that could be very frustrating for the offensive players on the Warriors, especially on the perimeter. So Peyton Pritchard and Derek White have been huge for the Celtics and going on the small ball lineup. I don't think it behooves them really to go with the two bigs on the court. I feel like that's been when the Warriors have been really able to do their most damage. Uh, We saw those um, high pick and rolls uh, where Al Horford was just getting taken advantage of uh, by Steph Curry. When we saw those wide open threes by Steph um, was a lot when they had the two bigs on the court. Uh, So I I think if Ime could keep playing this right, and I think he did a great job recognizing in the third quarter when the Warriors were going on their run, and making that adjustment, calling the right timeout to put the guys on the court that needed to be on the court to stop the bleeding. Ime has been very impressive throughout the series with what he's been able to do for the Celtics. Yeah, that's an interesting point for Boston because Boston, in game two, they shot uh, until they pulled the starters in the fourth quarter, but like through the first three quarters, the Celtics were shooting like 32% from the field. Yeah, and, and then Jordan game... Poole is going to hit like a 40 footer. That just, <laughs> just, just yeah. is what it is. And then in game three, they shot like, I think it was like midway through the third quarter, they sh- they were shooting 57% from the field. And that's a byproduct of Draymond Green was in foul trouble and the interior defense of the Warriors just fell apart after that fact. And so that's why it was Draymond Green's worst game of his finals career was because the interior defense just fell apart once Draymond got into foul trouble for the Warriors. And I, if Draymond plays like that the rest of the series, yeah, the Warriors have no chance. I'm assuming Draymond's going to go back to playing like Draymond, best defensive player of a generation, even if he's not that right now. Well, like we've putting seen that him in struggle in two games, two out of these three games to this point. So it's not a guarantee. If anything, it'd be on again, off again, on again, off again throughout the course of the series. And one thing pointed out is that Draymond had to defend more on the perimeter, which opened up around the basket. And that's, of course, where the Celtics were eating them alive during this game. I think they had 50 some points in the paint in game three. Were you arguing that Draymond played poorly in game one also? Yeah, he definitely played played poorly in game one. Al Horford was the leading scorer in that game and 
tore apart Draymond. The fact that yeah, Al Horford but, but, was a no-show in game two, yeah. I think was a big reason why the Warriors were able to capture that victory. But it felt like in game one, it was like they were all just hitting three pointers. Like it was Al Horford was like six for eight from three point range. And if you're Draymond, you stay in the paint and you let Al Horford shoot and you live with that point because they Not keep that Draymond Al and Looney down been playing inside. in this postseason. Because Al Horford yeah, but, has been hitting that shot all postseason. So if you're Draymond, you know you have to defend it. I guess I guess my argument is you live with it, but the Warriors are also saying we'll live with Tatum and Brown keeping the ball in their hands. Because there's only so many like, things you could live with before you die. This is exactly the point. Because in Game Two, I was amazed when I saw that stat. Um, kind of when they were getting ready to pull the starters, it was in the late third quarter. It was like Al Horford was six for eight from the three point line in Game One, and in Game Two he was zero for zero. <laughs> I was like, you don't even want to try. And, and see if you can replicate the magic from game one. I thought that was fascinating as a strategy. Yeah, Al, at the end of the day, is a 37-year-old player. So I feel like his inconsistencies are going to be a little bit from his age, even though he's in great conditioning. And he's been a huge difference maker for the Celtics, not only in this postseason run, but throughout the season. If you really want to break it down, Al Horford was the best offseason addition by any team. I will say that definitively here because DeMar DeRozan was great in terms of he was in the MVP debate for a little bit, but obviously that didn't really elevate the play of the Chicago Bulls to where the Celtics are now. Al Horford being on this team, I think is a big reason why the Celtics are a championship level team. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm doing the math in my head. I think I think you're right. Al Horford was the biggest offseason acquisition of any team this year, which is and it was an acquisition that was laughed at and scoffed and thought of as a salary dump type of move. They had to give up a draft pick. They had to give up a draft pick in order to to get Al Horford's con or to get rid of Kemba Walker's contract. Whatever the result of this series. You have to give a lot of credit to Brad Stevens in his first year as a front office executive because picking up Al Horford and getting Derek White have been two instrumental reasons why the Celtics are even at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll give Brad Stevens his flowers once we get closer to the end of the series. But yes, those have definitely helped. The other thing that was interesting about game three was Derek White wasn't hitting threes, but he, I think he had like three layups in the first half, which I know Derek White's he like a two true outcome the guy. best player on the Celtics at, right now at this point in terms of getting in the paint and driving. Like we've seen some inconsistencies from Tatum and we've seen some inconsistencies from Brown when they get in the paint. Uh, their dribble penetration, they are liable to turn the ball over. Derek White it, it seems to have fairly steady hands whenever he makes his moves in the paint. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not he's going to sink the basket because he's not going to sink it at as high of a rate as those guys, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. But he's been the best as far as kind of getting in the paint and leaving guys open on the perimeter. So if he kicks it out, then you have an open shooter. And that's where the Celtics have been a very drive and kick offense all season been instrumental. And the fact that he is hitting three pointers now, because he's been pretty good at hitting them since game five of the Eastern conference finals. I don't know what light switch turned on in his head, but uh, maybe it was having the newborn. Maybe it was becoming a dad because as soon as he had the kid, uh, suddenly he became like Steph Curry light. Especially, yeah, I was one. joking in the I was joking in the Eastern Conference Finals um, when I didn't realize he was out for his child, and I saw zero minutes. I'm like, oh, did they finally get smart and stop playing Derek White? <laughs> I didn't realize he was out, but I'm like, oh, they finally decided admit, to stop playing. I, him. I was frustrated at times watching him, but he, you know, he do, even when he's not scoring, he like I said, he's contributing on the court in very tangible ways. Um, I think it was in the Miami series where he had multiple blocks from behind Mono Ginobili just grabbing the ball when a guy's on the three-point line he's a pest and I, I think the fact is the Celtics role players the guys that come off the bench they're pest and they will annoy you on defense and I think that's important to have a few of those guys you add in you have Marcus Smart the defensive player of the year you have uh in the paint Robert Williams you have Grant who Grant this is the first game I felt he wasn't useless because Grant since game seven in Milwaukee was almost an unplayable asset for them. He was almost as benchable as Daniel Theis. But Grant showed up in this game, and hopefully if you're a Celtics fan or if you have interest in the Celtics, Grant continues to show up because he was very important for them in the Brooklyn series and at times in the Milwaukee series. And the ability to exploit 
the size advantage you have when you have Grant Williams, when you have Al Horford, when you have Robert Williams, I think is a difference maker for the Celtics. That's something that the Warriors it, try as they might, they just don't really have anything to combat. So yeah. those guys have to play well and if they play well. The Warriors, when they're not hitting threes, don't really have a great answer. Ooh, they do have a good answer, but the Celtics also countered for that in game three. And that answer is get to the free throw line. The Warriors only took 15 free throws in game three, which the Warriors should be shooting a minimum of 20 free throws every single basketball game. So that's the beauty of the Celtics is defending without fouling, which is so difficult when you're playing Steph Curry, Jordan Poole, uh, I guess even to a certain extent, Clay Thompson, but he's more of a pop and shoot guy. Uh, Wiggins is kind of in that camp too. And avoiding getting the Warriors to the free throw line. Cause I've watched the Warriors win the game against the Grizzlies where the last 10 points of the game were all free throws. And that's, they were losing at the start of it. And then they ended up winning by seven by shooting only free throws. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it. Like the Warriors greatest strength other than shoot. This is part of the system of if we shoot 40%, we're going to get to 110 points. It requires them to also shoot a lot of free throws because the Warriors are really good at that. That's why I credit their maturity too, and not engaging with Draymond because it's very obvious that Draymond's trying to bait them into doing something stupid uh, that it's important for guys like Grant. And it's important for guys like Jalen to just walk away in those moments, because the last thing you need is a technical. The last thing you need is to get into foul trouble, especially your stars. And then you have to change the complexity of your defense or your offensive scheme or who's on the bench, who's off the bench. I, I think that the Celtics being above getting into the foul issues is very important for them to be able to mitigate the Warriors offense. Like you said, keep them off the line because you talk about a guy like Curry, who's a 90% free throw shooter. You talk about a guy like uh, Jordan Poole, who was the best free throw shooter in the league this year. Uh, Clay certainly is almost automatic from there. Really, the Warriors as a team, when they're at the free throw line, they're fairly efficient aside from, well, Draymond, because some of his free throw attempts in game one were god awful. <laughs> yeah, but they don't need Draymond to play offense. They just need him to be a guy who, if he's not on the floor, they have an average defense. And if he's on the floor, they have one of the best defenses in the NBA. Game 7, 2016. Seems like a distant memory for Draymond Green. 30 plus that was a points, joke I uh, made on the internet, which was yeah. Draymond Green hit LeBron in the balls. It got suspended. And this game was still worse than that game for Draymond Green. He still had a worse impact on game three of this series than when he literally got ejected for hitting LeBron in the balls in the third quarter. So are you still 10 toes down on the Warriors or? Oh, I think the Celtics are going to win game four. I think the Celtics are going to win game four. And, and if they that's win just game a four, you're at, you're at this 3-1 series advantage. So are you basically saying at that point, the Celtics win the series? I'm not saying the Celtics win the, time, the series. I'm saying the, the I'm saying the Celtics are the better team than Golden State. That's not exactly conducive to winning the series. Like weird shit happens all the time, especially when you're talking about teams who are evenly matched to each other. Uh, maybe I'm emotionally hedging a little bit, but no, I think the Celtics are going to win game four. With or without Steph Curry, I think the Celtics... With, I mean, if, without Steph Curry, they obviously win game four, but like Steph Curry health permitting, I still think the Celtics are going to win game four. And at that point, yeah, I think the, the Celtics probably are in a good cruise control to win the series. It's not a guarantee, but like it's the Celtics are in pretty good position to win at that point. At least law of averages. Again, you take a three, one series lead and that's pretty much a death blow to most playoff series in the NBA. Um, I, I guess my hope is obviously that they just, carry that killer instinct because they really haven't had that um, since the Brooklyn series. Uh, they haven't really had that. We're just going to establish our dominance after a win. It's very important for them to obviously win this game. I think game four pivotal Steve Kerr knows it. The Warriors know it. Obviously I just need the Celtics to know it, but anyway, guys uh, just let us know who do you think wins game four? Drop that below in the comments. Leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel from Juju talk sports, Kyle, better stay safe, happy and healthy. And we will see you next time.